All right, guys, welcome. Thanks for coming on a Friday edition, the Memorial Day holiday edition of the Ledge Branch Capacity Working Group. I appreciate you all being here on a Friday before the weekend. And you didn't know, but today is the two-year anniversary of the Ledge Branch Capacity Working Group, a purposefully bipartisan joint venture between New America Foundation and the R Street Institute, founded by Lee Drutman up here in the middle in the black coat. There you go. And my boss, Kevin Kosar at R Street Institute kind of coming together to do a purposeful conversation about a bipartisan necessary conversation about does Congress have the capacity, its resources to do the job that we all expect it to do. And this month's Memorial Day uh, edition of this, this working group is national security and everything that entails. And we'll get to a lot of topics today. My name is Casey Burgett. I am a fellow with the governance team at the R Street Institute. And I'm joined by three expert national security people and they all have very particular expertise that you guys should take advantage of here today. The format of this topic before I introduce them or this session is as follows. I've asked them to give 10 to 12-ish introductory remarks about their particular fields. I've outlined what they do as a good moderator should. And then after that, it's open. I imagine that we're gonna dominate the discussion after they talk about what they are with North Korea, uh, Iran talk, because that is exactly what we're reading about. But feel free to throw any hard curveball questions their way. If anyone can answer them, it's these three. So with first, we're going to have the first 10 or so minutes with Paul Rosenswig, a colleague of mine at the R Street Institute. To his left is Megan Reese, another senior fellow at the R Street Institute. And on her left is Scott An Anderson, the David M. Rubenstein Fellow of Governance Studies at the Brookings Institute. So again, a bipartisan effort here. So with that, I'll turn it over to Paul, and we'll get this party started. I was at... Uh, uh Johns Hopkins yesterday, and Rubenstein got a, an honorary laws degree. So that's kind of that's kind of coincidence. I, uh, I, I, I too want to commend you. If I were in your position today, uh, I wouldn't be in your position. I'd be on the road already to wherever it was I would be going for Memorial Day. So the fact that you're here is uh, is truly a, a a notable sign of either your insanity or your commitment to uh, good legislative governance of America. I prefer to think it's the second of those. Um, so uh, I get to go first, and I was asked to kind of talk at a, at a more of a 10,000-foot level and let my, my two colleagues talk, uh, talk down at 1,000 feet about more specific topics. So I, I want to uh, address the question of Congress's uh, ability to participate in the national uh, security space uh, from a structural uh, sort of assessment. And, and I think any fair uh, assessment is that Congress's structure is not fit to the purpose of national security, governance, and participation. I, if I could characterize it in a, in a short aphorism, it would simply be that, that Congress is a Model T Ford in a world that moves at Tesla uh, or faster pace. And uh, that, to me, uh, defines what uh, the nature of the national security space is today and kind of what the problems for Congress are. So let me talk first a little bit about the national security space without reference to Congress and then turn to Congress. Uh, if we were to characterize national security problems today, uh, it would be one of accelerating threats uh, it, and metastasizing across domains. Uh, by that I mean that uh, the traditional notions of national security as restricted to nation state versus nation state conflict, which is uh, more or less the paradigm that guided the founding fathers, leaving aside the odd case of piracy. Um, no, it, it was an off case, it was, it was, but it was an exception that pretty much proved the rest of the rule, um, has now changed. Nation state versus nation state conflict remains uh, the centerpiece of national security, but we increasingly see a world in which non-state actors uh, are a significant portion of the threat, ISIS, uh, Al-Qaeda, you name it. Um, the second thing that is really um, a notable is that the pace of change is accelerating in ways that are difficult for people to imagine. I just went back and reread Alvin Toffler's Future Shock uh, the other day from, I guess it's about 25 years ago, and even then he was talking about the inability of human conception to keep up with the pace of change, and what we're seeing in the national security space is the mutation of threats at paces that are very hard for us to keep up with and comprehend. Um, and the third kind of uh, 
major factor that I think goes into this is the development of what I call asymmetric threat capabilities, which is to say that people who formerly, even if they were threat actors, could not do us harm, are now realistic imminent threats. Uh, and North Korea is a paradigmatic example. Before it developed nuclear weapons, uh, it was a who cares, at least for the American homeland. Today, uh, you know, I'll leave it to others to assess how realistic the threat is, but but the technical threat is real that there are that there's a capability there that may be exercised. So how does this kind of play itself out in terms of, of the types of things that we're seeing today? And I want to just mention some of the technologies that are 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 part and parcel of all this, it, available to non-nation state actors, coming at pace of change that you and I can barely understand, and providing asymmetric capabilities. Drones, uh, artificial intelligence, cyber threats, 3D printing, which is going to completely disrupt uh, the supply chain of every nation state and every military in the world, uh, mass data collection and analysis. All of these are things that if we'd had this discussion 10 years ago, literally didn't exist, except maybe cyber a little. But uh, literally, we've gone from zero to a, to a space in which we can conceive of swarms of drones overwhelming the defensive systems of, of uh, uh, air defensive systems of the nation's capital. And that's not a nonsensical uh, threat imagination, right? So that's how the threat stream, how national security is morphing, in my judgment. So what is our goal, right? Our goal is to enable the executive to be able to respond to these threats. That's not Congress's job to respond. But it's got the executive has to be able to respond uh, to these threats, this changing threat stream at pace. But it also has to do so with oversight, with audit function, with control from the elected representatives of Congress. And those two are generally in tension. In, they, you know, again, at the 10,000-foot level, our entire oversight system and legislative enablement system are about slowing down executive action, right? Separation of powers is about checking and balancing uh, the executive, uh, not so that it's ineffective, but that so it's effective within the bounds of whatever it is that we, the people, and Congress in particular, want that executive to do. And today, that concept of of uh, slowish action and effective oversight is breaking down under the pace of change. Um, yeah, the, uh, one of the best examples that I know of is another threat stream uh, that, uh, uh, that I didn't mention, which is bio threats. And the House Homeland Security Committee and the, and the Senate HISCAC have been trying for 15 years to pass a, uh, uh, some legislation that would enable of uh, the development of bio threat response systems. And as it stands right now, the executive is acting in this space pretty much unauthorized, pretty much without congressional oversight, because we can't bring the pace of that thing, uh, of that uh, 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 effort to, together. So what does that mean for Congress? Uh, let me bring that home to where we are right now. There are three things that I think are, are missing uh, in the congressional space today that need to be uh, put on the plate to make Congress an effective partner in national security. The first is expertise. Um, these are really deep and complex topics. You know, uh, I've spent five years trying to understand encryption, just one of the little topics. And I confess to still not really getting the, the math and the tech very well. And I've worked hard at it. We need to develop a deep bench, which probably means more people, uh, with longer term, term, longer time here, um, and that's both at the staff level and, frankly, at the member level. We, uh, we need to find champions of, of tech space and, and national security space with particular de uh, developed expertise. I mean, whether you agree with him or not, I love the fact that Representative Langevin has decided to make cybersecurity you know, his thing, and, and he's investing a huge amount of time uh, so that even when I don't think he's right, at least we're talking. To, so expertise, that's the first thing. Um, uh, second thing is responsiveness. It is absurd that we've never had a Homeland Security Authorization Act. It is absurd that we, yeah, it took eight years, 12 years, 
uh, to pass a cybersecurity information sharing bill. Again, whether you like the end result or not, 12 years is uh, six to eight more cycles in the cybersecurity realm. Just not a useful uh, a way of addressing these, this pace of problem. Uh, Homeland Security has over 100 subcommittees that are engaged in oversight. That prevents you know, a, a responsiveness by Congress to, to new threats in a ways that, that people in this room probably understand far better than I do. And then the, the last thing that I would say is essential uh, for congressional um, uh, uh, activity in this area is, is owning the problem, kind of responsibility. One of the things that we've seen, or I've, I perceive as being a, a growing uh, concern, is the, fa the fact of the difficulty of the tech to understand, the difficulty of the threats to understand, and the fast pace of change is used by, a, by Congress to avoid responsibility, right? It's happening so fast that we have to devolve uh, this responsibility to the executive because only they uh, are capable of some form of rapid response. Uh, you know, you're going to talk about the AUMF, and that's 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 a pretty good example of okay, we dealt with that when 15 years ago. <laughs> yeah, and we we can't bring ourselves to be responsible enough again without prejudice to whatever the answers should be. Congress is using the difficulty of the questions as a way of avoiding some of the difficult choices that really are, in my judgment, Congress's responsibilities. Uh, so uh, the End result here, at least in my conception of what a, a good congressional uh, participation in national security would be, would be for Congress to get back in this game. You know, it comes to it with a lot of uh, uh, de jure inherent powers, the power of the purse, the power to declare war, uh, you know, raise armies. It, it, it's got a lot of stat statutory and constitutional hooks on which uh, to base its authority, and what it tends to do is, you know, and this will, this will be kind of where I'll close it, it tends to simply say, we'll leave national security decisions to the executive. So virtually every law we have has a waiver authority for Congress to waive, national, waive for national security. We're about to see, uh, again, not talking to the merits, but talking to the process, uh, the president is talking about using that national security authority to raise tariffs on cars. Uh, under the guise of a national security thing. And that is, whether you like that or not, that's a power we've left with, with the Congress. Uh, we've, we've left with the President. Congress has left with the President. And it's time for Congress to reclaim that responsibility. To do that, it needs people who know what they're talking about, and it needs to be able to actually move at a pace to, to, to play in the game. It's no good running in the race if, if the executive is six miles ahead of you before you get out of the starting blocks. Uh, and, and that, I think, is kind of my summary at the 10,000-foot level of how the changing threat stream has more or less pushed Congress to the sidelines. And it's time for Congress to, to come back off the sidelines and get on the field to play. Awesome. Thanks, Paul. Megan? Pull this forward a little bit. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay. So that was great, Paul. So thank you for kind of teeing me up for what I wanted to talk about. And I'm sorry, Casey, I have to bring up the JCAE. So one of the, the major things that I see Congress doing really poorly right now is not being in creative in the way that they're addressing problems. So I'm here to talk to you about cybersecurity, but I think it is worth looking back at how we've dealt with novel threats in the past. And I think the most interesting congressional effort to look at when you're thinking about this is something called the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy that was developed in the wake of uh, the nuclear revolution. And it was, or it was established quite soon after the first nuclear bomb test um, within a couple years. And it was a way of Congress to make sure that there was not too much power vested in the executive branch. And so what they did was 
there was a joint committee, a House and Senate committee, that had at the time co-equal decision-making capabilities with the president on nuclear energy for both military and civilian uses. And this is a really, really interesting committee design because it assured that Congress had a voice and a really, really strong voice when it came to this novel threat, this new, new capability, new technology, so that the, the executive wasn't able to run roughshod over what Congress wanted to do. And something interesting happened in the 70s. Uh, Nixon happened, actually. And Congress had this pretty strong movement against executive power. They thought that Nixon was overly strong and had too much capability to do whatever he wanted. And obviously, Watergate played into this a lot, as they saw and an overuse of executive power. And so the Congress decided that it wanted to review a number of its options to restrain the president. And strangely enough, they decided to uh, establish a committee, the bowling committee, that would review the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy because it thought that it wasn't doing its job well enough. It wasn't checking the president well enough. It, it, its decisions aligned with the president too frequently. And so the, the committee thought that it was going to end up dissolving the JCAE with its co-decision making capability, dissolving this really, really powerful committee, and reestablishing something that could do it even better and make sure that it could check the president even more. And so they dissolved it during the Carter years, and they never managed to get it going again. So they actually lost this, this really strong ability to check the president through this joint committee because they were, strangely enough, trying to check the president. Um, but, but I think it's worth talking about this, this committee as a means of thinking about how Congress could take other steps to reestablish its power as the first branch. And so getting into that, why aren't we doing that or, some, or other sorts of efforts when it comes to novel threats that, that Paul outlined, for instance. And when you, come, when you look at cybersecurity, for instance, you're seeing a lot of efforts that are kind of slapstick. They're, they're, they're kind of pushed together and told to be coherent. We're looking at things that kind of fit together, but they're piecemeal, they're quilting. It's not a grand strategy, obviously. It's not even a real strategy for a lot of these efforts. It's just seeing what may be going poorly now, and then Congress takes up that particular piece of the quilt and said, okay, we're going to deal with this particular issue this year. And so you'll see something like the cyber workforce issue, which is a pretty easy one for Congress to deal with relatively because they have the, the power through the NDAA um, and other bills to say, let's build up the cyber workforce. But the, the truth is there are big, big things that Congress needs to work on that are, are bigger piece of the quilt, let's just say that. And so the two, the two things they need to look to are the rise of state actors as cyber threats and the lack of cooperation between the private sector and government. And so when it comes to state actors, this is actually a, the rise of uh, nation state actors as cyber threats are, should actually be that similar defining moment to the nuclear revolution. It really should, because it's a huge threat. There are a lot of different actors that could be threatening the US. Um, we're moving from espionage to potential kinetic activity here in a way that we didn't expect even a couple of years ago, even though this was happening at a smaller scale in Eastern Europe, we really didn't see this coming in the way that it exists now. Um, and so this could be a defining moment for Congress where it could try to 
think of ways to be another decision maker on these issues besides just the executive. And the other is we need to build up cooperation between the government and the private sector. And this, this needs to happen for a couple of reasons, but primary of which is 80% of, um, of the telecommunication sector uh, and cybersecurity rests in the private sector. And there's very little data sharing from the private sector to government and vice versa. And that's a huge problem because we're seeing threats go unnoticed for far longer than they should be. And there's very little reason for the private sector to share data with the government if the government isn't going to take up the cause, right? So you could be sharing data that doesn't actually lead to a solution. So what's the point of sharing data to begin with? Um, and so basically, Congress should at this moment be addressing these two issues to the best of their ability. And they're really tough. They're really complicated. It's going to take what, what my colleague Paul said. It's going to take a lot of, um, of expertise to deal with these issues. But there needs to be a real agenda setting moment here. And this is a really good time to do it. So thanks. Go for it. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. So I want to take a look at some of the structural questions that Congress faces when it engages in a lot of these national security questions. Uh, and particularly, I'm going to focus on the national defense, the military side, and the diplomatic or foreign policy side. Um, I think a lot of it boils down to the two questions, the question of delegation and the question of reporting or transparency, uh, depending on how you want to describe it. Delegation is important because Congress's primary role is to set up statutory frameworks that enable the executive branch to take certain types of actions, delegating congressional, constitu congressional constitutional authority to it, uh, for example, the ability to declare war under the declare war clause of the Constitution, uh, empowering the executive branch in a variety of ways. And on the other side, Congress needs feedback. Congress says, we need information about how the executive branch is using this authority to ensure that it's doing it in a way that we approve of. Uh, and that's the kind of reporting or transparency requirement. And these questions have come up are at the core, really, I would say, of a lot of the national security statutory frameworks Congress is looking at, has looked at, and needs to look at more closely. Um, and the one that uh, Paul mentioned I was going to talk about, which I'll start with, is this question of the AUMS, the Authorization for Use of Military Force. Um, for folks who don't know, the United States uh, enacted an AUMF shortly after the 9-11 attacks in 2001, uh, and that has been the primary statutory authorization for most of our counterterrorism operations for the last 17 years uh, against anyone who's kind of al-Qaeda, Taliban, or ISIL affiliated now. And the executive branch has done this more or less unilaterally. The wording of the AUMF is fairly broad in the first place, uh, at least it's fairly short, uh, and then the executive branch has interpreted through several administrations of both parties more and more broadly to incorporate a, a, an array of other entities that fight alongside or co-belligerents of uh, ISIS or uh, al-Qaeda. Um, many people have raised objections to these interpretations. They say it departs from Congress's original purpose. And perhaps most importantly, Congress has had no role in this, very limited role in this, which many people find objectionable given that Congress does have the authority to declare war under Article 1, Section 8 of uh, the Constitution, I believe, uh, if I'm quoting it correctly. Um, the, so we've had two models that have come out just in the last few weeks that show the kind of two different approaches Congress can take to this sort of question. Um, one is a Corker-Cain proposal. This is sponsored by uh, Senate Foreign Relations Chairman Senator Corker, Bob Corker, and Senator Cain of Virginia, so bipartisan proposal, um, that basically would modify and step up from the current framework. It delegates a lot of authority to the president. It allows the president to expand the scope of military operations to new armed groups associated with al-Qaeda or ISIL, uh, to new foreign countries as needed. But it requires, and this is what it does new and improves upon the 2001 AUMF, it requires the president to report those changes to Congress. And then it gives Congress the opportunity to try and enact uh, legislation that would reverse those decisions. Uh, and it does through some, so, through some expedited procedures that allows them to avoid certain blockages like filibusters that would have stuck that legislation. Although, I, as I've written uh, in Lawfare and a few other places, the actual procedures it prescribes are not actually as defensive or protective as, as they could be. Um, the second proposal was just introduced this past Wednesday evening. This is by Senator Merkley uh, of Oregon. Uh, and he takes a very different approach, which is very specifically designed as a response to the corker Kane AUMF. And he sets out a framework that would require Congress to keep approving 
every expansion of the use of force beyond a core framework, which is just al-Qaeda, ISIL, Taliban in Afghanistan and Iraq. Everything else has to be approved by Congress. Now, to make it easier, he also uses expedited procedures, these kind of efforts to make it easier for Congress, and he adopts much stronger ones that protect an actual substantive vote from basically any sort of blockage, including a filibuster, uh, meaning that it should, in theory, go to Congress and get a full up-down vote um, from both houses as to whether these expansions happen in short order, in about 24 days is the max, 25 days is the maximum time frame um, that that could take place if it has one supportive member in Congress, which presumably all of these would. The choice between these two is hard. It's a hard one. You have to boil down to a lot of different questions. But I think it raises three ones that apply to a lot of these different sorts of frameworks. The first one is, is the need for what I'll call tactical control here. This is the question of how much does the executive branch actually have to exercise discretion in this framework? Certainly, there's a good argument if you look at how terrorist groups evolve and change that if we don't want forces in the field to have to go back to Congress uh, and ask for new authorization every time a group changes its name, every time it recruits a new set of allies from some sort of affiliated group, every time it splits and changes. And if you follow the conflict in Syria the last couple of years, these are very real things that happen with some frequency. Um, you know, they would need to have some level of discretion. But does this mean that the president needs discretion over which countries the conflict expands to, or the maximum scale, or that there's no congressional back end review? That's an, one question. Another one is a question of congressional dysfunction. Uh, and this is what a lot of people say why the president needs such broad authority, is the idea that Congress gets held up. You have individual senators who have immense authority in stopping legislation. Committees can kill legislation. Again, we have these sorts of procedures that both of these proposals use to try and get around this. Um, but they're far from perfect, in part because they rely on each House of Congress's constitutional rulemaking authority, which can then be changed by subsequent houses of Congress, meaning that they're not permanent, even if enacted into law. Um, so there's a question there. And the third one, which is really the core of it, is preventing the abuse of these sorts of delegated authorities. Uh, how does Congress and what does Congress need to know about how they're used and what triggers or cues does it need to be able to respond adequately to ensure that the executive branch isn't using these authorities in ways it wildly disapproves of? Um, we've seen all sorts of different approaches here. The real trick here is that uh, you know Congress used to do this by trying to set up different types of voting regimes that would allow essentially it to give a up, thumbs up or thumbs down to actions the president would use under statutory frameworks. This was called the legislative veto. But since 1983, the Supreme Court has said that that is unconstitutional. So essentially, this means that now when Congress gives a delegation to the executive branch, uh, it has to revoke it. It has to go forward and say, I'm going to enact whole new legislation that would restrict or revoke that. But that new legislation is also subject to presidential veto, meaning essentially you need two-thirds of both houses to revoke that sort of legislation over presidential objection. It's a very high threshold, very hard to achieve these days. So it's an added challenge for Congress to say, how do we manage this relationship with the executive branch? And this leads me into another issue that I want to talk about, and this is a related question of kind of war powers reporting. Um, right now we have a kind of hodgepodge that's evolved over many, many years about when the executive branch has to report to Congress or to the public about when different authorities are used. Uh, so the War Powers Resolution of 1973 says that any time the president, without statutory authorization, me under his own authority, deploys troops into hostilities or deploys them armed for combat, um, he or she then has to go report to Congress within 48 hours and tell them the legal basis for that action, if there is any. Um, they also require six-month updates that says, OK, well, now every six months, we need to um, go and uh, say we, what the current status of this conflict is. Um, we also have specific operational notifications that Congress has enacted recently for things like sensitive military operations, covert action. But again, these are little pockets of specific type of operations. Same for security assistance, types of build and assist authorities. Uh, and we have this new framework uh, that we'll talk a little bit about that as of this last NDAA requires the executive branch to report on the legal framework for its use of force, articulating Here's how we use force and how it links to the legal authorities that have been provided to us by Congress or the Constitution or international law as well in some cases. But there's lots of gaps that these leaves in behind. We've seen these recently in recent years. One is changes in mission. The War Powers Resolution didn't anticipate the way that we have, what we have now, which are these overlapping systems of, author of authorizations. So now you can deploy US forces to, let's say, Niger in Africa on a mission to build, and build capacity or support local forces training them up. And those forces can then switch mission to an AUMF mission targeting. Uh, Al-Qaeda forces or ISIL-related forces. This is appears to my, from my reading to be what happened in Niger um, <coughs> last year. That doesn't trigger any of these reporting requirements because it's not something that was anticipated as each individual one was designed. 
also legal innovations. Um, a lot of these authorizations are fairly broad, and that allows the executive branch to interpret them and use them in novel ways. Uh, in Syria, and since 2017, 2018, uh, we have seen the US forces actually engage in combat with forces associated with the Assad regime, and in one case, shooting down a Syrian fighter jet near Deir Zor. Uh, this took place, we learned several months later, once a report was filed, that this was done under the 2001 AUMF. They've, re they've interpreted the AUMF to expand it to say, we can use it now to defend our allies when they're being attacked even by third parties. There's a lot of good arguments as to why that's the case. But again, because it was this novel interpretation, even though it was a change in the way these forces were used, a change in their mission set, it was not reported to Congress. The third obvious one for a lot of people is the international law justification. War powers resolution only covers domestic legal authorization. So with the serious strikes recently uh, that the Trump administration pursued, there is this sort of big question that says, what was the international law justification for these? It's a double-edged sword. You know, if there's reasons why we may not want to force people to make international law justification, uh, and I accept that. But there needs to be a debate saying, well, well to what extent does, is the administration obligated to share its views if it has them with the executive branch or with, or, sorry, with the Congress or with the um, bigger body. And so I'm running out of time, so I'm going to try and do this very quickly. Um, there is a, I think this raises kind of three questions. Um, oh, the third question I'll say, there are two questions that this War Powers Resolution um, issue sort of raise. Um, one is that all these reports are coming in from all these different authorizations that have accumulated over the years, but nobody's really sat and said, I'm going to assemble and redesign these or try and do it in a logical, comprehensive way. Does one body in Congress receive all these reports? Does that body have the capacity to read all of them, digest them, and put them together in a way that would allow them to see the whole picture, even if that's available there? Um, I don't know for certain, because I, I, I have worked at the State Department. I have not worked in the legislative branch uh, on these issues. Um, my sense is that no, though. You know, After the Niger incident, we saw several high-ranking senators involved on the relevant committees who had first <laughs> initially expressed shock that US troops were there, even though that had been, in fact, publicly disclosed, but also weren't aware of their mission set. And there's an ongoing issue here about this sort of question of capacity and scale. And so I think this, this brings us to two takeaway points. I have one more example I'll save for later for questions in this instance of time um, that's not related to defense authorities. First one is there is this trade-off between kind of reporting and authorization. Uh, there's this question about right-sizing delegations. And because of the Chada decision, because of this inability uh, and this obstacle faced by presidential vetoes, the question about how much delegation should be given um, in regards to and giving Congress the ability to correct actions when information comes in that it doesn't like the sorts of actions that are being taken under a delegation. Um, I've argued in the context of the AUMF that this is a very good reason to have sunset provisions, provisions that end a particular authority on a particular date, maybe allow for that to be extended by a congressional vote, but that requires some affirmative congressional authorization at some point down the road at regular intervals that allows you to avoid the presidential veto problem, essentially. Um, but that's not an, a fix-all solution. There are many other contexts where that may not be appropriate. Um, the second question I'd say is right-sizing reporting. There is this real question about what sort of reporting Congress needs and has. Right now, there are lots and lots of reporting requirements. The executive branch spends an inordinate amount of time responding to them. And it gives so much information to different parts of Congress that it's, I'm guessing, I'm fairly confident about this, really hard for staffers to actually figure out what's going on because they have piles and piles of reports they have to sort through from different time periods. And often, pardon me, and I'm almost out of time, I'm going to take two more minutes, uh, two more seconds, uh, and they have to sort through these piles, try and put it together into a cohesive picture. And then because of the burden on the executive branch, these reports are often not timely. They're often very short. Um, sometimes they're not submitted at all. Um, this is not an ideal solution for either party, the executive branch or the congressional branch. But until somebody takes a ch an effort to really sort of right size, and not only that, continue to adapt and improve upon these reporting requirements in a way that responds to current changes, um, you're going to continue encountering this problem. And the third question this raises, I think, is that of public transparency. Um, th there are many, many reports, and lots and lots of information goes to Congress, but does not go to public. Many of these reports are available to you if you choose to go walk to Capitol Hill and see them in hard copy. You can't take a copy out. You can't take pictures of them. You can't report them. Um, this is in part because of the kind of dominating strategy between Congress and the executive branch has been one of inner branch sharing, but not public transparency. That's appropriate in a lot of circumstances, but I'm not sure it is in all. In a lot of these cases with this volume of information, crowdsourcing, for lack of a better way to put it, is a really good way to have people digest and put together the big picture. There are lots of academics and scholars and journalists who are interested in doing that. 
It comes with a risk. It means that there is some journalist or some think tanker somewhere who's going to seize on some detail and make a bigger deal of it than they should or misunderstand it. There's a 30% chance it will be me, and I apologize in advance. <laughs> But at the same time, it also is a powerful tool through which Congress could use to have smart people and much big manpower, much bigger manpower than they have internally, digest a lot of this information and put in a more digestible package that can then guide policy changes. So I think there's a good argument for more public transparency in a lot of these areas. Um, I think I'll leave it at that. Scott, I think you just set the record for number of words per 13 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> that was intense. Um, I want to give you a chance to respond to each other's because they didn't know what the, each other was going to say mostly today. So I would like to hear your thoughts on what each other said, particularly if you disagree with them. Um, but then I want to open up to questions. And I'm going to reserve the right to ask the first one, which I'll give you a little bit time to think about while you respond to each other. And that's, it seems like you are advocating, at least in Paul's and Megan's case and some to Scott's, for some pretty big wholesale changes. Congress seems to be behind the curve. They're playing catch up by years, if not decades. So it leads the question of what realistic step, realistic is the key word, can they take to, to close that gap, to, to take some sort of, in Paul's words, take the reins back on this. There's huge political and even economic transparency, privacy issues at play, but what issue, what first step can they take to, to kind of level that playing for, field to, to play the role that we think that they should play? So to respond to each other first. Uh, answer me second, and then after that, we'll throw it out to the audience. You go ahead. You okay. got, we, we have the same question. Okay, so great. I'll let, yeah. She wrote it down, and I looked at it. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking. <laughs> yes, Scott. Uh, State Department lawyer, brilliant. Co author of mine recently. Um, so, cybersecurity is this big, complicated topic, and DOD likes to try to figure out the nuances in this field. Um, and there is going to be more offensive cyber action in the future. There just is. There's, there's recent reports coming out of uh, different branches or different agencies are advocating for more offensive action. When does this require authorization? When does this require reporting to Congress? Um, uh, there's, there's this, in the cyber law field, we talk a lot about how a, a use of force in cyber or a cyber offensive action that equates to a use of force is people like to talk about a dam being opened when it shouldn't or taking out the electric grid. But I would say that things short of that would still constitute a use of force. So when are we actually going to have clarification in a way that will lead to all of these other things that require authorization by Congress or at least reporting to Congress under these uh, statutes? Well, absolutely. Uh, I didn't plant this question, but I have a good answer for this because it just happened this last year's NDAA. Um, first, on the question of who authorizes this, that's a really good question. I don't think we 100% know because most of these are covert actions. Um, you know, if I had to guess, uh, I don't, I'm not aware of any statutes. It's very hard to do a secret statute. Uh, so I'm not aware of a lot of statutes authorizing this. So unless it's being done against al-Qaeda or ISIL under the AUMF, it was most likely being done as part of the president's Article II authority. And we've seen the president make subsequent presidents, I should say, make broader and broader assertions of their ability to use force under Article II of the Constitution. Or alternatively, it's that the internal view is some of these don't rise to the level of being used of force for that purpose. And there is probably a gray area between those two, and probably shifting views a little bit as people work through these. Um, the reporting question is a much easier one, because Congress is worried about this. And Congress, and particularly the Senate Armed Services Committee, deserves a lot of credit for having really thought very hard about these issues in the last couple of years. Uh, this past NDAA that was enacted at the end of last year uh, actually establishes a reporting requirement, which for what are called special sensitive cyber military operations, which tracks essentially reporting requirements for similar sensitive military operations, which would be like snatch and grab. We go in and kidnap somebody. So when uh, the Defense Department, or the US government, I should say, deploys certain cyber assets for these sorts of offensive action, there is now a reporting requirement through classified channels back to parts of Congress. Um, there's also, interestingly, another reporting requirement that, getting to one of the other things I touched on, 
actually requires the Defense Department to analyze the lawfulness of cyber weapons under international law and then report that back to Congress. Um, and this is from, again, frankly, a Republican-dominated uh, Congress that the kind of stereotype is somewhat more hostile towards international law considerations. But certainly use of force area, that has not proven true. Um, many, many of these legislative measures we see coming forward take international law and restrictions really seriously. And I think this is a great example of that. Um, the uh, and so there is this kind of defined reporting structure now that's evolved and built up and, and copied and pasted in a good way, I'll say, from the way we treat other kind of sensitive operations. But that doesn't mean there aren't still gaps. Uh, and some of the gaps I described before most probably would not apply to a cyber operation because it doesn't deal with deploying personnel in theater, um, but other ones do. And it's certainly at least the fact that the Senate and the Congress is thinking about these is very good, um, but it'd be nice to see them think about it in a broader context of reform, looking at how all these pieces fit together. I believe it would all be through classified channels, I suspect. So we haven't seen it. I'm not, I'm not sure it's been de delivered yet. I actually looked when I was up on the Hill uh, the other week, and I hadn't seen any yet. But uh, that was also something that could take a long time. And there was no fixed timeline for it, as I recall. Any other back and forths with each other? All right, if you have audience questions, please throw them this way. And if you would, introduce yourself and perhaps where are you are. Are we supposed to answer your question first? Yes, I, I agree. My <laughs> question is. You, you, you gave a question. I yeah, you're right. I actually have an answer. Um, uh, so I'm going to address, um, well, first off, you said, what can Congress do to fix itself? I'm assuming that I'm allowed to assume partisan, bipartisan agreement that, that, that that's I don't know why something we want to do. But why would right. I mean, that? Uh, be, well, I, well, we might not. I right. mean, there, there's a value in Congress to the gridlock itself for sure. that, that some people might see as valuable, and it, that would very much depend upon whose ox is being gored in any particular mm -hmm. moment. But um, if Congress wanted to actually participate affirmatively, I, I would say that there are two things it needs to do. Um, the first is uh, on the, the idea of expertise. Uh, Things like uh, revive the OTA, the Office of Technology Assessment, um, more technologists at, uh, at the Library of Congress uh, in the Congressional Research Service who understand uh, the, these types of things. Uh, so uh, probably larger staffs, too, uh, 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 which means probably another couple of office buildings here, but that's a different story altogether. Uh, so that's build your expertise. And then the second one, if, vis-a-vis -vis responsiveness is, you know, I am struck uh, powerfully by how the only, the only way we can even think about getting to answers about things like the AM, AUMF are by uh, exempting national security from the standard operating procedures of Congress, which are, which are designed to slow things down. And, uh, you know, if it wants to systematically play in this field, Congress needs to find a way to, not, to make that not the exception but the rule, uh, too many committees with too many pieces of jurisdictional pieces, um, bills are too readily uh, sidetracked. Yeah, I mean, we probably will never get a new AMEF because somebody's going to filibuster, right? And somebody can stand up and doesn't like it. So, so um, and that's really not a national security issue. That's more of a Congress doing anything issue. Mm -hmm. but, it, but we feel it more in national security because if we don't change the tax rate this year, it's just the same as last year. And, but if we don't respond to uh, artificial intelligence, I just picked one, you know, it, it, in two years it's going to take over the world. Right. At least Elon, Elon Musk says so. <laughs> right. So that's my answer. Yeah. Megan, you ready? Yeah. Um, there are a couple things you could do. The, the most important thing that Congress can do in restraining the executive or building up their capabilities is decide they want to. Um, the 1970s mm. has a lot of examples of efforts that Congress took to restrain the executive. We don't study history very well. We don't look at our own past and learn from it. And that's, I mean, that's just the first and best way to look for examples of restraining the president or building up uh, congressional ability. Uh, 
Another one which, which you got to is the jurisdiction issue on national security. Any creative thing that a committee wants to try, if it touches on another committee's jurisdiction, they have to get sign off. Another committee is not going to want to sign off on one committee having interesting capabilities unless they want, uh, they're gonna want the same capabilities or they won't and they won't want their, their other jurisdiction to have that capability. That is crazy. It's actually crazy to not want to try and innovate in a field like cybersecurity just because if DOD wants to do something, DHS has to sign off on it. No, that, that doesn't make sense in the end when you're trying to deal with a novel threat. Um, so those are two, two of many things, but yeah, read history, biggest. Um, I would say two, two things that, that can be done immediately in the short term, particularly on the reporting issue I have. Maybe a third one that's a little slightly longer time. Two immediate ones is that, first, the public transparency thing is a congressional policy, not an executive <coughs> branch policy. It's not something you would want to change without consulting with the executive branch, making them aware, having a conversation about it in a reasonable way. Um, but a lot of these reports are things that are readily foiable if they're non-classified. Uh, so it would be very easy for Congress to say, look, we're going to start making these more publicly available. Again, you can already walk into the office and read in a hard copy. You just can't take pictures or can't put it online. Uh, and there's a reason why these things leak constantly to the press. Uh, but it'd be nice maybe to have a little less selective leaking with the people's interests and the various interests that come into play in that and maybe just a little more general transparency. Um, the second measure is, is also the level of reports that, that is made by statute, even though they're discussed in law and practice, really is up to Congress again. Um, when the executive branch is laid on a report, it will, in the best of times, go to the con committee and tell them and say, we're going to have this report done in you know, 30 days, 60 days. Sorry about that, guys. And usually the committee's like, yeah, 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 that's fine. 30, 60 days. Give it to us. Um, lots of reports never happen. And they only happen sometimes if the committee raises a stink about it. If the committee wanted to say, look, all these nine redundant reports about Iraq we have, we're going to waive all of them if you give us one. Just give us this one in a timely manner. They could do that. But again, it requires somebody with the bandwidth and the time to step back and say, I'm going to look at the whole universe of reporting and reduce it to one thing. Um, another issue about this authorization question, I mean, Paul is absolutely right. Like, we have these huge obstacles in the, in the, con the congressional process, which is designed to be slow and deliberative. Um, we do have one workaround, kind of, which is this big omnibus legislation that we keep using, things like the NDAA, which become Christmas trees where you see people hanging all sorts of legislation on it. The latest NDAA draft that just came out of the Senate Armed Services Committee yesterday, I think, um, has lots of stuff in it. It has a provision on foreign investment review, uh, which is a whole other separate law that was re released by committee but then dropped in the NDAA. Could be a fine law. I haven't read it. I'm reading it later today. Um, but uh, it's not a criticism of the law. It's a criticism of this process, except that it is valuable and that it becomes very hard to veto. So there are some ways around that. Internal congressional procedures make that very difficult. It's problematic on its one front, but it could be a way in dire circumstances where Congress really could put the pressure on the president by doing what the Constitution says is Congress's ultimate authority, controlling the purse strings. So I'm going to jump in and actually tell you all a secret. So I, I was the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Policy at DHS in the second Bush uh, term, uh, second Bush's second term, right? And um, we had lots and lots of reports that were required, and, and they all went through the department, it was, uh, uh, and we instituted a rule that was never written down. So this is the first time it will ever be publicly known. Uh, we will give no report to Congress until after it asks for it. Well, yeah, well, other than the other than the authorization, right. other than the authorization that says file this report. If if they don't ask for it, we don't do it. And if they ask for it, that's when we start. <laughs> I'm, I'm not I'm, I'm not joking. And and probably forty percent we never never did. Do, do you remember the really cheeky thing that the NDAA did last year on cybersecurity? They they basically threatened to withhold partial funding for the White House Communications Office unless they actually unless the executive actually produced a cyber strategy and a cyber deterrence uh, strategy. I mean, little things Congress can do to make sure that they can fulfill their oversight role. Forty percent is not a good grade. That's an F. Uh, let's open it up. Introduce yourself if you would. Yes, Ms. Kelly.
That's a great question, and I, I agree with your characterization, uh, which is that we've, come, we've become deeply over-reliant on uh, military capabilities. Um, let's at least acknowledge why that is. It's because the military actually is one of the few institutions in America that, that we can look to to function, and we still have some confidence that it will. Uh, the, the best example that I know of this is the increased militarization of response to disasters. Uh, and uh, in which we bring out the National Guard, not because they're, you know, that's the right tool. It's it's simply because our civilian tools have atrophied, um, and it and it kind of goes back to uh, what we've been talking about before, which is uh, that the civilian agencies have not had an been given the capabilities, opportunities, resources uh, uh, by Congress. To, uh, to, to achieve their jobs. Uh, you know, we, uh, at DHS, they can't hire enough cybersecurity analysts because the pay is poor um, and, uh, and the working conditions are, are not so great. And, uh, and, you know, who would want that job? Uh, so, so, of course, when we actually have stuff we need to do, we look to NSA uh, or Cyber Command, as the case may be, because there they, the working conditions are better and, and it, it's a natural... Uh, so the answer to your question is, is really, it's a long-term thing, which is uh, re-energize the expertise of the civilian agencies, which means energizing the expertise of the civilian congressional uh, oversight and funding and, and uh, authorization committees. You can't, you can't expect DHS's cyber security people to take the reins and do the job that we want them to do instead of the military if we've gone 18 years and there isn't, has never been uh, uh, Homeland Security Authorization Act that actually gives them some sense of what it is Congress wants them to and doesn't. So that that's my answer. Who else? Yes, go ahead. Uh, Mike Stearns, former congressional lawyer. Um, so my the, the Congress now is basically organized around the way the agency or the departments, right, were organized many years ago. Um, how, how would Congress even go about trying to figure out how to reorganize itself to be more in tune with what the, basically the, the executive hasn't so much reorganized itself except for Homeland Security, uh, it, but it has a lot of different missions um, spread across departments and agencies. How would Congress think about 
I, I, I don't want to. I don't want to keep answering. I got it. Got answer. You got to answer. Why don't you go ahead? I go. Yeah. I'll build off yours. <laughs> well, I, I mean, you're absolutely right. I think that the executive branch is likewise not so functional. But the executive branch has, um, has structures that are at least somewhat capable of coordinating. Uh, across the agencies. Rather than reorganize the agencies, we've layered on top the NSC or the HSC or the, or the uh, economic policy committees, domestic policy committees, you know, and it keeps changing all the time. Uh, and, you know, frankly, uh, when, uh, when the executive branch does that function well, it actually can drive um, us to a kind of uh, coordinated response in the executive branch. It's one of the reasons I thought the, the ending of the cybersecurity coordinator was such a mistake because it was basically going backward in a backward direction. Uh, Congress can do one of two things. The first is it could find some mechanism for this kind of cross-cutting organizational uh, superstructure that married across existing committees without changing the committees. Uh, that would require some kind of leadership, some kind of bipartisan leadership legislative coordinating commission, if you will, that uh, parcel that we saw a little bit of that uh, in uh, in um, uh, in the run up to this uh, to this Congress, where uh, uh, all of the chairmen of committees with jurisdiction over DHS committed to allowing a, a in the House committed to allowing a, a homeland authorization bill to go forward. Uh, it it is now got no real prospects in the Senate, but at least, I mean, but that was, a, the, the leadership actually was willing to take the reins and drive that. So you could institutionalize that. That's, that's one answer at that level. You know, the much more ambitious level is to start, is to deconstruct con congressional oversight and make congressional oversight by, by function or utility or idea a, the cyber committee across all of the a executive agencies, or the you know the mi you know, the military could stay in the pretty much in the armed services, but you know you could you could try and do it that way, and uh, that would require a, just a wholesale blow up. And so you asked what was realistic, right. and that's not realistic. So, so I, I'll go with the coordination council up at the top. Yeah, go ahead. Responses? No. Did you want to hit the cycle? Well, smaller is better. Nice. I teach an undergrad class. I will stare at you all day until you ask <laughs> questions. <laughs> yes, go ahead. Hey, uh, Graham Markowitz with uh, Congressman Dan Heck out of Washington State. Um, I have a question that's not quite fully formed yet, but um, something we all kind of mentioned public private partnerships and We're seeing um, companies reach out to protect themselves, if not hacking back, uh, seizing servers that are infringing upon their copyright um, or IP. Mm -hmm. Should Congress create some sort of reporting mechanism for when um, private sector actors uh, act in such a way that you might perceive as a cyber offensive? And what is our responsibility for oversight? Yes, so this, this is actually happening 
already. And that's a big problem and companies don't want to break the law. So they're being told, so basically the administration in January, I believe, um, it was Nielsen, correct? She, uh, there, was, there was some discussion about whether or not we should push companies to take offensive cyber actions to protect themselves or stop these aggressive actions. And then immediately there were questions that came up of, this, some of this stuff is illegal. They're not allowed to do it, but they're being encouraged by the government to do it. And so there are, there's some legislation going through on the House side, I believe, Graves. in order, what? The, Tom Graves from Georgia okay. has a yeah. To, to deal with to this. Through, <laughs> yeah, so, so the goal would be that there would be coordination up front. So if a company wanted to do this, they'd coordinate with DHS right away before they actually took those offensive measures. And so they wouldn't be stopped from it. It wouldn't, if it was flagged as being illegal, they wouldn't follow through with it, but they'd be able to take these actions to protect themselves. This is a big problem with the public-private um, divide on, on all of this stuff is the government doesn't have the ability to address every single threat because there are so many cyber threats out there. And so do companies have any ability to to address these on their own if it doesn't reach this massive level where, where the government wants to get involved. And it's just a big sticky question that we're going to be dealing with over the next, well, quite a while. I'm, I'm just gonna jump in. I'm just gonna jump in and say that your question identifies in small exactly the problem I was talking about in large, which is Congress has been talking about uh, hack back and uh, offensive cyber operations by private sector actors and whether or not it's illegal under the CFAA for, to my certain knowledge, at least eight years um, without ever once uh, having a bill, and I think I know of one hearing in the past eight years. Um, practice in the real world has moved so far beyond that. Uh, companies respond because they feel they have to. Uh, to the extent that they're afraid of American law, they outsource it. They hire people from Israel or from the Ukraine to do it for them. And then they say, yeah, we just hired them to help. We didn't, you know, whatever they do, it's up to them. Um, and so the reality is that the, the, the threat stream is morphing and the response stream is morphing at a pace that far outstrips Congress's ability to do oversight. And, and part of that is it, it, exactly as we've been talking about. We've just been talking about it, right? We, and, and we haven't even talked about it much. Yeah, if Congress could figure out a way to get in the game and set the rule, the American companies would abide, right? If, if we, you came down and said no or yes, but your question, I mean, I don't want to disagree, but just asking for more reporting is another way of trying to avoid the responsibility, right, uh, that I was talking about. Uh, no, no offense, because at least we'd know a little more, but, you know, it, Congress, if it wants to play in this game, should, should say, we like this, everybody go do it, or we hate this, uh, and we're going to prosecute, uh, and, and DOJ go prosecute people who do this. I, make up your mind. One man's view. Let's do one more. One more before classes in recess. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, there's there's a division. Um, <laughs> in I I think it's culture. You're going to have to actually address cultural divisions between Silicon Valley and DC, and that's really really hard and tricky. And it's going to take the public being upset with tech companies to kind of push them towards a solution that works for everyone. It's not going to be easy, though. So, so basically, tech, the tech world has this interesting, they tend to be pretty liberal in a lot of ways, but they're also libertarian. And the libertarian uh, side of a lot of these uh, 
computer guys out in Silicon Valley kind of, they want to fix it, they want to break it down, and they want to fix it, and government doesn't need to be a player in that. Now we're seeing, of course, that some of their fixes or some of their companies in general put the public in precarious situations that they don't know or understand. And I think that's where the government probably needs to get involved is they do have an obligation to make sure their citizens have enough information to protect themselves. Um, and I see that being the most likely role of government in the, this tech divide when it comes to sharing of information, for instance. Um, yeah, do you see that? On words, panelists? Awesome, well thank you guys very much. Class dismissed. <laughs> Thanks for coming.